Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the second of five talks about integrity. The way I'm using the term is to consider integrity as that drive within life to maintain itself in the face of changing circumstances and the various challenges that arise. In other words, it's related to what we call resilience, a kind of stability in the face of change. There are a lot of ways of looking at integrity. I've chosen to look at it through the lens of two complementary qualities, separation and connection, which we can see in dynamic balance at many levels of life, from the ecospheric to the whole organism, to the cellular, to the subcellular. In this series, we'll be looking at all of these levels in order to get a sense of how integrity operates within life. As always, I encourage viewers to take the conceptual knowledge that's contained within these videos and sit with it in a contemplative and meditative fashion in order to internalize it and go below the level of cognition to a somatic feeling for what integrity feels like in the organism and in the society and the ecosphere. We can feel integrity when we interact with one another. We can feel integrity when we walk or move in any fashion. We can see integrity in the natural world. All of these can be experienced without a lot of conceptual overlay as a direct reality. Because after all, life existed long before there was language and concept to explain it. And so part of our task as meditators is to add to our repertoire to get beyond confinement within a sphere of language and concept and take in life in other ways, on other levels. So with that as an introduction, let's go forward and address our topic, integrity. So we've looked at integrity as a dynamic interplay between separation and connection. Oftentimes in our society, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on separating. We have fear of many aspects of our surroundings, other people, the uh, changes in our ecosystem, the possibilities of diseases arising within our bodies, etc. And we feel a strong desire to protect ourselves from these various threats. This is wholly natural and is certainly a part of integrity. We must protect ourselves from threats if we are to survive and reproduce and continue the species. Separation is established in many different ways, really in countless ways. For one thing, we have a skin that covers our bodies. The skin separates the interior of the body so that the moisture that's important to life stays within, it doesn't dry out, and so that dangerous microorganisms in the environment don't penetrate in order to infect the tissues. So skin plays an important separating role in these and other senses. Of course, we're looking here at a human hand, and we have the skills that go along with handedness. We can use our hands to build technologies that further protect and separate us. We can build shelters and weapons, etc. And then we can wield them with these hands. We also have an emotional system that in many cases operates to maintain separation, that is to protect our boundaries and our rights. When we get angry, we are generally protecting ourselves or those that we care about. We're establishing a line and telling the threatening person to avoid crossing it at risk of you know, some kind of consequence. This is a natural and healthy function of anger is to maintain separation when necessary. The very sophisticated and elaborate human immune system, which we'll be talking about in the fourth talk of this series, is also a separating organ system. It serves to keep the vital and resource-rich cells and tissues of our bodies separate from harmful microorganisms and malignancies, etc. I've already touched on the idea of technology as being something that separates us. 
and we can look at a typical example of a city, in this case a walled city, as preparing for us a separate and protected environment. The wall, of course, is protecting us from human invaders. The buildings, though, are protecting us from environmental extremes. And if there are storehouses containing uh, food supplies, then we're being protected from resource depletion, etc. So separation is an important part of human life, and it has been throughout human history. And indeed, it's an important part of all life and has been throughout the history of evolution on Earth. But so too is connection. It is equally important and equally active. We can start with the city. Yes, it is a protected and separated space in important ways, but it's also very profoundly connected with the environment. The food that comes into those storehouses comes from the surrounding fields, as does the water. And there are many other examples of, the, of ways in which cities are connected to the environment as well as connected to other human communities. The immune system doesn't just protect us against harmful organisms, it also mediates a kind of conversation with supportive bacteria. So we know now, these days, about the so-called microbiome, the beneficial bacteria that live in our intestinal tract, particularly in the colon, but really throughout the gut. These organisms are important to health, and our immune system maintains a kind of conversation with them to reap the benefits, to favor the organisms that are helpful, and to discourage the growth of harmful ones. Our emotions, of course, are not just protective. They don't just defend boundaries. They are also affiliative, and they can serve to bring us into contact, into connection with others. In this talk, I want to focus on how our connections work at a technological or cultural level by looking at an anatomy and the biology of the musculoskeletal system. As we'll see, a lot has been learned about muscle and bone. I will only present just a few fundamental facts, of course, but the amount of information is quite vast. This information was the result of a lot of work by many people over many years. That is to say, these people were laboring together, sometimes working together in the same lab, sometimes communicating with colleagues uh, in other parts of the nation or the world. And there's also been a connection through time, as papers that were written years or decades ago are expanded upon, the findings advanced, etc. So the progression of knowledge about the human body, like all technologies, depends on a lot of connection between individuals. If we remained completely separate from one another all the time, none of this would be possible. In the previous two talk series, I introduced the notion that our experiences as humans can be divided into several layers, or as I call them, bodies of experience. I refer you to the previous series about fluidity, or the one before that about sensitivity, to get a more detailed explanation. But we will be touching on it in this talk, so I'll give a brief overview. The objective body is the one that we talk about with concepts and language. It's the body of science. It's also the cultural body. When we compare our appearance with the appearance of others, we're objectifying the body for that purpose. The mammalian body is the body of the animal experience, of having hunger and thirst, of eliminating waste, and having emotions, and feeling desire and drive states, etc. The cellular body is a diffuse experience of aliveness that goes from the top of the head to the tips of the fingers of, and toes. Throughout the entire body, we feel a slight vibrating, warm, alive sensation. In other systems, this is referred to as chi or prana or bodily energy. As I've explained in earlier talk series, I believe it has at least something to do with the cellularity of our bodies and the aliveness of individual cells, which we feel as a diffuse, vibrating, warm sensation due to the diffuse distribution of cells throughout the whole organism. 
Finally, there's the universal body, which is the body that is, in some sense, the most realistic because it reminds us of our connection to the ecosphere and the universe at large. It's quite possible to experience the body as being deeply and intimately embedded in the earth and arising from the planet in both evolutionary and personal developmental terms. This is both an experienced reality that we understand objectively and within our tissues. We can feel the power of nature, feel how breath comes from the outside, feel how our food is derived from the landscape and so on. In some sense, this is a nice layer of experience to focus upon as we try to move beyond our sense of frightened isolation to feel a safer, more connected existence. As it happens, there's another layer that I will introduce toward the end of this series. It's a little bit harder to explain, and so I'll defer that for now. Today, I want to focus on the objective viewpoint. So the objective viewpoint, as stated, is when we look at the body as if it were a separate thing. So we have this very powerful human consciousness that can examine the body as if from a distance. So even though we are living as bodies, we can look at the bodies of other people objectively, and we can even look at our own body in that way, as if it's a separate thing. And of course, in the current era, we have a lot of tools at our disposal for examining the body. Many very advanced scientific methods allow us to get an incredibly detailed picture of what's going on inside the body all the way down to the cellular and subcellular levels. With the aid of all that technology, we now know a great deal about all the different organs in the body and how they interact and what sorts of messages they send to uh, each other and on and on. It's a very powerful and in my experience, a very beautiful monument to the power of the human mind to understand, to analyze through this objectifying function. In today's talk, as already suggested, I want to focus on what we've learned about the bones and muscles of the body. That is to say, the musculoskeletal system. As I've already suggested, there's an enormous amount known and we will only be scratching the surface. And yet even that little scratch into the musculoskeletal system, I think will be quite revealing. So let's begin with bones. Now bones are separate from one another. They're only held together in most instances by soft tissues that can be dissolved away. Without the ligaments and muscles and tendons that wrap around bones in ordinary life, they are separate from one another. So the bone exemplifies this quality of separation. Now there is, of course, a quality of connection in the body and in the hand that we're currently looking at. Part of that connection comes from muscle, that tissue that we know contracts and drives the motion of the body. There are also connections from the tendons. Technically, these are rope-like structures made of collagen that connect muscle to bone. And by the way, there are ligaments also that are collagen elements that connect two bones together across a joint, for instance. We won't talk about ligaments further and we won't talk about tendons much. We're going to focus on muscle and bone. So here's a simplified picture of a muscle and a bone and a tendon connecting the two. Let's first look at muscle. So we could imagine that this is a familiar muscle like the biceps. This is a very simplified view of it, but it makes the point that the body of the muscle, the belly of the muscle, is composed of many bundles that are packed into it, in sort of separate, long structures called fascicles. Okay, so there are many fascicles in every muscle. And within each fascicle, there are many muscle cells. So a fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells and a muscle is a bundle of fascicles. Going further, the muscle cell itself is, in important senses, a kind of bundle of what are called sarcomeres. Okay, so a sarcomere, in the simplest terms, consists of thick fibers, shown here in red, and thin ones, shown in blue. 
the thick fiber is referred to technically as myosin and the thin as actin. When the muscle contracts, the myosin, the thick fibers, tug on the actin, the thin fibers, and pull them together, pull them toward one another. So we can see how the vertical white bars are drawn closer as the fibers get closer to each other. So the myosin pulls the blue actin fibers closer together, causing contraction. The expansion phase that we see in this very simple animation is passive. We don't need to exert energy to relax a muscle. We only need to use energy to contract it. And so the working phase of muscle is the contraction. We can't do work simply by relaxing a muscle, right? So the myosin is actively pulling on the actin to contract the muscle every time we move. Well, we can look at that process in considerably more detailed ways, okay? So we're going to take a look now at the muscle and eventually at the sarcomere uh, with a little bit more careful uh, attention to some of the details. So here's the muscle with the bundles that we call fascicles in them. Okay, so the muscle is a bundle of fascicles and each fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells. So here's a muscle cell and the muscle cell is a bundle of sarcomeres. And there's the sarcomere. And when we look inside the sarcomere, we can see the myosin, which tugs the actin. Here the myosin is central, shown predominantly in yellow, and the actin is up above and down below, shown in red. The myosin has those little handles that we're tugging, and we'll see this in higher magnification. Here are the handles. There's one that we're going to focus upon, and we'll see that it reaches up and grabs the actin, connects with it, tugs, and releases. So there's a connection, a tug, and a separation. The myosin reaches up, connects, separates. Reaches up, connects, tugs, separates. You get the idea. Now there's a lot more going on in that animation, and the animation itself is extremely simplified. So all of this is way more complex than I'm making it sound. But the important point is that there's a molecular process at depth within the sarcomere, which is to say within the muscle, that is generating the forces. So let's look at that just a little bit further. And we can compare it to a person tugging on a rope. Okay, so there's a connection, a tug, and a separation with each hand. And let's turn this upside down so the orientation matches the animation a little better. There's a connection, a tugging, and a releasing. A connection, a tugging, and a releasing. Okay, so it's just pulling. And this is, in effect, what's going on in a muscle, a kind of pulling on a rope. The myosin has these little paddles that pull on the rope of the actin. So here we are again. We'll look at the process. The actin is the brown. There are two fibers running diagonally in the upper portion of this frame. And the myosin is the yellow strands and the green paddles down below. And the myosin paddles reach up, tug, and release. Reach up, connect, and separate. Reach up, connect, tug, separate. Reach up, connect, tug, separate. So hopefully I'm making this somewhat clear. It's a lot to try to convey in a very short period of time. Now each individual tug is relatively mild, you know, very mild in force, but when we bring millions and billions of these little tugs together, we start to generate substantial amounts of force, as we know our muscles can. And so we can kind of reverse, put everything back together, sarcomere in the muscle cell, muscle cell in the fascicle, fascicles into the muscle. And now we're back where we started. Now none of this is you know, terribly important to try to remember. You know, the names myosin and actin are kind of arbitrary. But the idea that there is a complex molecular process that's producing a kind of tugging activity at depth in our muscles every time we move 
is I think in a way a profound fact. It shows how energetic and how intricate life is, even in the most simple act, for instance, the act of breathing, which of course involves muscle action. So that was the muscle. I'm not going to say nearly so much about bone. If you want to learn more about the bone, I would refer you to the series about reality on the website. Uh, it's, it's called the Reality Series, and the second talk in that series, Relating to Earth, has a description of bone in it. But I do want to say a little bit about bone. So we have these bones that are, in essence, separate from one another. That is to say, the bones don't make a direct fusing contact with each other, except in a few, few locations, like uh, around the sacrum. There's sometimes a kind of fusion. But for the most part, the bones do not connect directly with each other. They're only connected through soft tissue, through ligaments and tendons and cartilage and muscle. Because of this separation, the bones can move in a fluid and active way, and we can do fun things like dancing and playing. Now, the skeleton is very familiar to us, and we'll just take a brief look at one of the more familiar bones, the thigh bone or femur, happens to be the largest bone in the body. And if we look at the head of the femur and enlarge it, we can see that it's not a solid chunk of bone substance. It's not a solid piece of calcium mineral. It's got a kind of porous or honeycomb-like appearance. There's a lattice of bone fibers, so to speak, that are in a kind of weave in the interior of the bone. Now, there are regions of bone that are denser and don't have this weave, but much of the volume of large bones is exactly like this. Here is the bone weave shown uh, in actual life, a photograph of bone from which all the soft tissue has been removed, and we're just seeing the arrangement of the calcium lattice. Well, there are some important reasons for this lattice within bone. One is it limits the weight and the amount of calcium resource that's needed to put the bone together. If the bone were a solid chunk of calcium, it would be much heavier and it would take a lot more resources. So this is much more efficient. But in order for the process to work, the lattice structure of the bone needs to be properly aligned so that it corresponds to the lines of force that the bone experiences in life. And so there is a continual remodeling process going on within the substance of the bone as old calcium mineral crystals are removed and new ones are laid down, continually updating the interior structure so that the bone always has a fairly optimal alignment uh, with the lines of force. So the bone tissue is by no means a static, unchanging thing. It's a living tissue that responds to changes in stress. This is the reason, for instance, that people who are at risk of osteoporosis are encouraged to get as much weight-bearing exercise as they can. The weight-bearing adds stresses to the bone and promotes the growth of bone tissue within the bone substance. It stimulates the deposition of more calcium salts along these lines of force. So this living tissue we call bone exists within these isolated, separated pieces. And when we move, these pieces are moving in relationship to one another. So when we run or walk, there is a characteristic pattern of movement of the bones one relative to the next. Well, that pattern of movement is determined in part by the pattern of muscle activity in the muscles that surround the bone and cross the joints and so on. So here we're looking at a plot of how active each muscle is, that is to say how much it's contracting as we walk, so that the muscles at the front of the thigh are contracting as the leg moves forward, right? So we can see as the leg moves forward, the muscles in the front tend to contract to pull it forward. Nothing very surprising here, but the point being made is that this is a very well-coordinated process involving a great many muscles. 
And when we add in everything that's going on in the depth of those muscles, all of that activity that creates the contraction, as well as the living processes within the bone, we can see how dynamic and active this is. We can also see how separation and connection are operative at various levels. So there's the separation of the bone and the connection of the muscles at a large scale, but there's also the separating and connecting activity that's going on at the molecular scale. So the whole point of this is just to increase an appreciation, a felt sense for the sophistication and subtlety and beauty and perhaps mystery of life. So we have this musculoskeletal system with the largely separated bones and the connecting muscles. This combination of elements that are separate and elements that connect is, in my way of thinking, reminiscent of the structure that I showed in the last talk, a so-called uh, tensegrity construction. This is a highly resilient way of putting things together. So we have these rigid pencil-like elements that are separate and a string-like element that brings everything together, that connects them. This kind of construction is very resilient and tolerates a lot of deformation without you know, falling apart and collapsing. And our bodies are benefiting from that same balance between separation and connection, particularly in the musculoskeletal system that we've discussed today. As a consequence of that resilience and that construction, the body is capable of all sorts of impressive and beautiful actions. So we can do this kind of sophisticated and elegant movement. Now, I personally can't do this, but a human body properly trained and of the right age and conditioning uh, certainly can. And of course, the dancing can involve more than one person. And then the separation and connection can be brought to yet another level as the connection and separation proceeds in a dynamic uh, way between two individuals or really an arbitrary number. But we'll just look at this couple dancing. So they come together in connection. And then they separate. And then they connect again. And if we kept watching, they would separate again. So separation and connection, we can see it all around us. There's nothing very surprising here. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know pretty well, but it's nice to take a little bit of time to focus on this dynamic interplay between complementary qualities which is something that characterizes life, not just in terms of separation and connection, but in many other aspects that have been discussed throughout the Mindful Biology series. And today we began with this idea that the objectifying function of the human mind is capable of looking at the body as if it were a separate thing and learning a great deal about it. And we can take some of that objective information and return it back into our direct experience of the body that we have as our companion from birth till death. That is to say, our own individual body. We can feel within it aspects of separation and aspects of connection. We can feel the muscle moving the torso as we breathe. We can feel how breath comes into the body, connecting us with the atmosphere, and how we then separate from the breath within the lungs as we exhale, and so on. And I encourage you, as I often do, to take the conceptual information and sit with it in a contemplative and meditative way, feeling into your body with mindfulness and noticing qualities of movement, separation, and connection.